every one of you sitting here today are a possibility. Okay, there are things that God wants to do in you and through you to accomplish His purpose on planet Earth. And you have to realize that, understand that, and say, Lord, what have you called me to do? When I was in the seventh grade, I was 12 years of age, and I, was, I took wood shop. And so I thought I'd take one of those courses that was, you know, kind of an easy one, supposedly, or whatever. So I went into wood shop, and in wood shop, we made all kinds of things. And obviously, we were learning how to to cut stuff out on the jigsaw, cut stuff out and then glue it together and, you know, use clamps and all of that and sand it down and polish it up real nice and, you know, lacquer it and all those kinds of things. Well, I remember one particular item or one particular piece that we were all working on in this project. And this project was these wooden ducks. Have you ever seen these wooden ducks on the wall with the metal wings on them? That was our project to make those. So I remember you start with a block of wood, you take it over to the jigsaw, and you have it measured out. You have a template, and you, you put the uh, outline of the duck on there, and then you take it to the jigsaw, and you cut it out and turn it around. Then you take it over, and you take it to a router. Does everybody know what a router is? Yeah. Rounds the edge off. So then you take a router, not trying to cut your fingers off. You know, it's, you know you're 12 and you're in seventh grade. I mean, you, you know, have you ever seen a shop teacher? Yeah. They always are missing a finger. You know, it's like this. All right? Our guy was no different, all right? Always the shop teacher are missing a finger. So, Joe, were you a shop teacher? <laughs> so anyway, they always had a missing digit somewhere. So you want to be careful that you don't come out like them, okay? So it seems like a career in that arena. It's like you, you got to, you know, that's like, that's par for the course. It's a rite of passage. So I remember cutting it out, and then I took it, and I, I put it on, a, uh, on the router, and router the edges off nice and round, and, and then you begin to sand it. So you sand it with the rough grade sand first, the rough grit, then you start refining your sanding and sanding until it becomes really smooth. Is everybody still with me? Until it's really smooth, and it's got the nice beak on it and all that in the, in the tail thing. And, and then you begin to lacquer it. So then you lacquer it, you put your lacquer on it, and then, you, and then you lacquer it some more, lacquer it some more, steel wool, the final coat, all that, you know, so it looks really nice. Well, I got frustrated towards the end of my duck, and I decided, I decided I didn't want my duck any longer. Now, my duck had plenty of potential, but I didn't see the potential in it. So finally, I don't remember if I sold it or I gave it to somebody, I'd try to make a buck off it or something, but somebody took my duck off my hands and they finished the project with my duck and they put the wings on and it became a beautiful duck because the possibility was there. I just did not complete the possibility. Somebody else took it and completed it to the end. You say, well, why am I sharing that? Because in the same way you're sitting here today, I believe there's a divine mandate on your life. There's a calling, a gifting, and anointing on your life. God wants that possibility to be released, but it's up to you to participate with the potential that is there, the possibility that is there in that particular thing. And so you must realize I have the possibility of great potential. Say that with me. I have, I have right, now, right now the possibilities of great potential. Look at somebody sitting next to you and say, you have the possibilities of great potential. You absolutely do. In a speck of a watery material smaller than the dot overnight, you know, like a little eye with a dot on it, all the future characteristics of a child are programmed. The color of their skin, eyes, and hair, the shape of their facial features, the natural abilities they will have, all that a child will be physically and mentally is contained in germ form in that one fertilized egg. From it will develop, note this, 60 trillion cells, 100,000 miles of nerve fiber, 60,000 miles of vessels carrying blood around the body, 250 bones to say nothing of joints, ligaments, and muscles. Think of the brain, for instance, with its capacity for recording facts, sounds, odors, sights, touch, pain, with its ability to recall, with its power to make computations, with its seemingly endless flair for making decisions and problem solving. Now, some of you have greater comp uh, 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 computing possibilities than others. Could you fix me? Thank you. I got to look good. So now there's an example. Uh, my wife and I have different computation co capabilities and possibilities. Mine are less than hers. Hers are much greater. Math was not one of my stellar classes in school. I was better at reading. I was better at, uh, at English, things of that nature. Math and I just did not get along. And so that's why I thank God for computers and, and I thank God for ca calculators and thank God for people who know how to use them. Amen. I was listening to Ben Carson recently. Ben Carson retired. He was a pediatric neurosurgeon, brilliant mind, Christian, loves the Lord. 
In fact, is moving maybe towards some political bents and has been interviewed on a number of talk shows and would carry a bent that I believe would resonate with many of you sitting here today. So one of the things that he talked about is he says in neurosurgery, he says the brain is an amazing thing in the fact that you never forget anything that you have seen, looked at, or you've ingested into your brain. It is there for recall. That brain is an amazing piece of equipment that you today, as you understand from our teaching, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made by God Almighty. Is everybody at Psalms 139? Take a look, if you would, please, verse 13. We'll start there, and we'll read on through. This is a Psalm of David. In fact, he used it, he, put, he pinned it to music, and uh, he sings it as well as states it. Verse 13, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came in to being. I want to talk about four things today. The first is because of our design, the possibilities of potential because of our design. Note that verse, verse 12 and 13, for you created me in my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's wombs. We have been created. Go with me to the book of Acts. Don't lose your place here. We'll come back. But let's take a look in the New Testament that even the apostle Paul understood. And Luke records the fact that you and I have been created with, with agenda, God's purpose in our lives. So go to Acts chapter uh, 17. Is that what I said? Verses 24 through 38. Acts 17, verses 24 through 38. Here's what it says. Then the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he, gives him, he himself gives life, everyone life and breath. Everyone say he gives life and breath. He gives life. And, everything, and it says, then going on and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that's Adam, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history. How many of you know today you are sitting here right at the appointed time in God's timetable for your life? Don't say, well, I wish I was born 100 years ago. I wish I was born 50 years down the road. No, you said you were in the right time frame. You were in the right generation. And the reason God has planted you and placed you within the generation or multi-generations in which are comprised in this place and those watching us and wherever they're watching us from is the fact that you are here by God's mandate on purpose for this time, for this season, for the people all around you. Now, he goes on to say in the text, he goes on and says this, da 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 okay, verse, uh, verse 26, latter part, and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him, that's in God, we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, we have been created. There's a design for our life, and it's a very special purpose for each and every one of us. Now, you may be sitting here today, and maybe you're sitting here and you're wearing designer clothing. And the reason they, they clar clarify it and call it designer clothing is because it's the designer who made it. Are you with me? Gucci, Calvin Klein, uh, let's say Milana Blahniks for school, Jimmy Choo's. I mean, these are, how many of you know Jimmy Choo's are like, you're talking thousands of dollars for a pair of high heels. You ever see these ladies, you know, and they got these like high heels like this? I don't even know how they can wear, <laughs> ladies, I honestly don't know how you can wear high heels. I mean, they're like this and they're like, they're like walking around, and, <clears throat> and what's really bad is when you blow a high heel. That's really bad. When you snap one off, you know, and you, you, blow a shot, you blow a shoe or whatever. But all of those are because of the designer that made them. Halston. I mean, on and on we go. Any, does any of the names ring a bell to anybody? Polo. All of those are names of different designers. In the same way, we have the greatest designer of all. His name is God Almighty, the creator of the heavens, the universe, the sea, and all that is in them. The creator of you sitting here today, that you have life and breath. It's been given because of God, and he is the awesome designer. Go with me to Job chapter 10, please. Job chapter 10. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, if you're wondering where it is. Most scholars and theologians say that Job is the oldest extant book of the Bible. That when we read Genesis and forward, it's not chronological other than the fact that it tells the creation story from that perspective, but the oldest book is in actuality Job. Go to Job chapter 10, look at verses 8 through 12. We're talking about being created and we're talking about being knit together. So as you're, as you're going there, uh, as you're going there, I talk again about the fact the creation, something designed, something made. So let's move it from seventh grade. Now I'm in eighth grade. I take another class that's one of those, what we would call fluff classes. It was called, it was called metals class. Okay? 
And so I went into metals class, and I just said, I'm going to make myself a screwdriver. Now you're moving from wood to metal. So you're working with lays. Anybody work with a lathe? There's wood lays and metal lays. So I, I just thought, I'm going to make a screwdriver. So I start with this piece of steel like this tube, and I put, you know, you tap the ends, and then you, and, and then you put it on the lathe with these two little things, and they call them chucks, and you tighten them up, and then all of a sudden this thing starts spinning, zzz, like this. It's spinning. And you take a tool, a knife, and it's a, a certain dimension, and you put it on there, and you start peeling the metal off. And you put oil on it at the same time. I love doing that kind of stuff. I'm no good at it, but it's still fun just to dink around with it. <laughs> So I start, neat, 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 metal start peeling off, little strands of metal, neat. And so I have the handle up here, and then I make this part where the actual screwdriver is, I make it, you know, smaller, neat, neat, neat. And so it goes, it's a full-on metal screwdriver. It's not just the thing that you put a piece of plastic around. This puppy is steel all the way through and through. So it's the handle is steel, then it bevels down, and it's got my screwdriver itself. And then when I'm done with it, I take it, and I begin to heat it, and I smash the end of it, so I have a nice flat end. And I'm, you know, and then, neat, 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 neat. I'm taking the, a grinder and grinding on it, all those kind of things. And then there's the checkering on the, on the handle. I put checkering on it so you don't lose your grip. And, and then I'd take it, I'd heat it up, and I'd stick it in the oil to harden it. Heat it, stick it in the oil. And then, then finally I get it all hardened up, and then I polish it all up, and that's my screwdriver. I wish I had it to this day. I'd put it on the mantle someplace. Look at my true accomplishment from eighth grade metal shop. I actually made this thing. How do you know you and I are better than a screwdriver? We're better than a screwdriver. God has more imagination and creativity. In fact, the Bible says we've been created in His image. Praise the Lord for that. Now, in Job chapter 10, verses 8 through 12, note this. Here's what it says. Job writes, and he says this, 8 through 12. Your hands shaped me and made me. You will now turn and destroy me. He's making a rhetorical question because he doesn't understand who's coming against him. Remember that you molded me like clay. Will you now turn me to dust again? Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese? Clothe me with skin and flesh. And note this, here's the verse I want you to see. And knit me together with bones and sinew. You gave me life and showed me kindness. And in your providence watched over my spirit. There's a knit. He, he describes the weaving of the muscles, the sinews, the ligaments, the nerves, the blood vessels, the bones, all of it being put together. When I was reading this, it reminded me of my son, John Mark, when he was a little boy. We were pastoring in Roseburg. There was a guy in our church named Art Bonowitz. And Art Bonowitz, would, he, would, he would like knit and crochet. He was a full-on man, but he liked to knit and crochet. And then what he would do is he'd make blankets and he'd enter them to the fair. Remember this, honey? So my son, you know, we were, we were miles away from our family. You know, a lot of times pa- families grew up and the kids, grandkids grew up with their grandparents. We didn't have that. We were like hundreds and hundreds of miles away. So you're very cautious about who you allow to watch your kids. So Art and Lucy, they were part of our eldership team and our leadership team. So we would uh, let John Mark go and stay with them. We'd go do something, and he would stay with them. And so I remember coming back one time. We had been somewhere, and here's my son. He's just a little guy, and he's knitting with Art Bonowitz. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm not sure I really like this so much. Hey, I knit. Huh? I knit. You I'm knit? Okay. You admit it? You're a man and you knit, huh? Oh, yeah, praise and God. Crochet. So And crochet. So he had these things, and he... Now tell him when he comes out of the kids, remind him of this. Yeah. So he's knitting away. Man, he loves it. And I go, I'm not really sure I like him liking this so much. So he was knitting things, and, and, and Art was knitting things, but praise God, he's fully man, fully guy, and I mean all that, so praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, so are you, huh? <clears throat> but he was knitting. And out of that came, I don't know if he ever accomplished anything, but he had like a little square patch or whatever. I don't know. He'd, I'm sure he'd like to have that on his mantle someday too, you know. When I was a kid, here's what I knitted with my own hands. In the same way, what we're saying from this passage in the book of Job is he's saying, I knit you together. You were put together. Listen, you are not an accident waiting to happen. You are here on purpose. You have, you have, you have calling. You have destiny. You, are, you have possibilities of potential resident on the inside of you. And it's up to you to say, Lord, how have you stamped me with your imprint? What are my gifts? What are my talents? What are my temperaments, God? How have you put me together? How have you wired me? Those are keys and hints to what God wants you to do. Not only that, but what's, what's the passion? What fires you up? If you could do anything in life and money was not an object, what would you do? Ask yourself that question. But it has to coincide with your gift. Listen, if you want to be a virtuoso and you can't carry a tune in a bucket, it's probably not going to happen. <laughs> now, I used to want to sit down at the piano and never take a piano lesson and just sit down and miraculously pray under the, play under the Holy Spirit anointing. Now, people have done that. But it wasn't me because I prayed many times, Lloyd, and I would sit down and I'd... And it wasn't there, man. 
I had to learn how to play chords. My, because I played the guitar, my wife taught me chords. So I translated. She says, all right, here's where a C, here's where a G, here's where A minor is, D minor, here's a D, here's a e, e flat, B flat, so on and so forth. So I learned how to play haltingly, but I learned how to play better than if I tried to sit under the anointing. Now, I could still be sitting under the anointing. Lord, teach me. Lord, let me flow. And it just wasn't there. But I had to learn how to do that. But there are some people, literally, that God comes on them. So what am I saying is that usually what you are called and wired to do corresponds with the natural temperament, gifts, and capabilities that God has given you. So when you say, hey, here's how I've been put together, you can begin to realize that. Recently, Helen had to do one of these, what we call a DISC test, D-I-S-K. Is that right? C, D-I-S-C. And what it is, it gives you different temperament types. Basically, it's what, it's what Tim LaHaye did back with the, the four temperament types. Remember that? Yeah. We were into that, all that thing. And those things are different expressions of people and temperament types, yes. And so sanguine, penguin, and all the other... Ki- no, just... But what they do is it is a key and insight. You got it. Nobody else did. You got it. So, so anyway, it's all right to laugh in church. You probably didn't get it anyway, so it wasn't that big a deal. So, so my deal is this, is you have a design. The reason, the, the, the possibilities, the potential are is because of our design. You've been created by God. You've been knit together by God absolutely on purpose. Number two, it's because of our development. Everybody say development. development. Now go back to the book of Psalms 130, development, development, 139. He says this in verse 14, I praise you. He's praising the Lord. Now why? Because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. He has a revelation. And when you have a revelation, it's something. What happens is it releases joy in you, that you begin to magnify God. That's why the Bible says in in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 15, it says, let us therefore offer up the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that is acceptable through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. You begin to praise Him when you you all of a sudden you get a, a revelation of how you've been put together and the possibilities in you that haven't begun to be tapped yet. Now, there may be people sitting here today, you burned a lot of your brain cells on drugs. Man, you were, you were smoking pot, you fried, you're walking around in a zombie state. God's got to extract and take, because now how you know we don't use all the potential of our brain cells? So we're going to pray that God restore what has been burned out by drugs, alcohol, or whatever, and say, God, that which the canker worm, the palmer worm has stolen, all of that I'm going to reclaim in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody. You're going to take it back. Now, we're not, we're, not, we're not venerating that lifestyle. That was an old lifestyle. But I believe God can restore things that have been broken, bruised, and taken advantage of. Hallelujah. So we're developing. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. In the book of John, chapter 1, the New Testament book of John, as John writes, he declares that Jesus Christ was the creator of all things under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Here's what it says. Verse number 1, John 1, 1. Every, everybody there? In the beginning was the Word. That's the Logos. That's God. That's Jesus Christ. And the Word, Logos, was with God. And the Word was God. Not only is Jesus with God, He is God. He was with God in the beginning. Note this, verse 3. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was the life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. How many of you know, when you shine the light, I, uh, where's Jeff? Jeff's back there running the TV thing, but he's been making posts on our website, and he made a post. He says, what happens is that light will outshine the darkness. When you let the light in, man, the darkness just has to go. Now, my point is this. Not only have we been created physically, that's called, that's called physical life. But there's another dimension called spiritual life. That when you were born, you were born into sin. The Bible says in the book of Romans, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. We know that. But here's the key. When you came to Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, what took place is that you began to be what was called born again. The moment that you said yes to Jesus, your spirit person, the spirit part of you, was born again and made right in relationship with God the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ, whom we're going to celebrate in the communion supper today as we recognize the accomplished work of Calvary's cross. Do I hear an amen? Amen. So there's a being born again. So as in the natural you develop, so also in the spiritual you develop. You can't stay a baby. You've got to grow up. You got to grow from 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 diapers to big big boy and big girl underwear. Okay, at some point you got to make a transition. At some point you got to learn how to put your socks on for yourself. At some point you got to learn how to tie your shoes for yourself unless you're just using the strap time, this you know the the velcro ones all the time. But but what we got to do is we got to grow up. There has to be a development that's taking place. He says, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. 
So David is bursting forth as he thinks that he thinks that man is the crown of God's creation. Think of this for a moment. Animals, you know, they have a soul, but they don't have a spirit, you guys. Okay? They don't have they don't have a they don't have a spirit, they have a soul. That's why we're the we're the epitome of the created beings. And we're not some animal. I'm just going to tell you right now, we've been created in the image of God. Do I hear an amen? amen? Not only are we fearfully made, but we're also wonderfully made. Go to Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. Look at verses 9 through 13. Isaiah the prophet writes, and he says this in verses 9 through 13. Woe to those who quarrel with their maker. Those who are nothing but potsherds and among the potsherds on the ground. As the clay say to the potter, what are you making? I don't like my nose. I don't like, uh, I don't like my height. Yes, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm height challenged. <laughs> my wife's taller than, vertically challenged. Thank you for that. My wife's actually taller than I am. And she says the older we get, it seems like she's even growing more, more taller than I am and I'm shrinking or something like that. She's, <laughs> so it's the other way around, huh? He says this, the potter has no hands. Woe to the one who says to the father, what have you begotten? Or to the mother, what have you brought to birth? This is what the Lord says, the Holy One of Israel and its maker concerning the things to come. Do you question me about my children or give me orders about the work of my hands? It is I who made the earth and created mankind on it. My own hand stretched out the heavens. I marshaled the starry host and he goes on and on and decrees about his capability of creation. My point is this, is that there is a development. Now, even in the womb, how do you know that there's three trimesters that take place when uh, a woman conceives and begins the process of moving towards that birth process? And there's this fearfulness and wonderfulness that goes along with it. So the most dramatic changes in development occur at the first trimester. During the first eight weeks, a fetus is called an embryo. The embryo develops rapidly, and by the end of the first trimester, it becomes a fetus that is fully formed, weighing approximately one half to one ounce and measuring an average three to four inches in length. Okay? Going on. Now, that all the major organs and systems have been formed in the fetus, the following six months will be spent growing. So the second trimester takes place, and the weight of the fetus will multiply more than seven times over the next few months as the fetus becomes a baby that can survive outside of the uterus. By the end of the second trimester, the fetus will be about 13 to 16 inches long. That's like a nice-sized kokanee right there. And weighs about two to three pounds, which is a nice kokanee. It really is. It's about, it's about like that. If you're a fisherman, you know what I'm talking about. Or a nice trout, Brett. Yeah. So, so it begins. Now, the pastor, that my home church that I grew up with in Rapid City, South Dakota, my pastor, uh, when I, he came when I was like seventh grade. His name is Earl Johnson. And I can remember his story he'd teach, and I remember the story to this day. You know, you remember stories really well. Is when I was born, I was born premature. I weighed three pounds. I fought for my survival. He says, my bed, when I was a baby, was a shoebox. That's how small I was. He was a miracle baby who happened to be a man called by God to be a minister of the gospel, lead many, many, many hundreds and hundreds of people to Jesus Christ and influence many people for the kingdom of God. How do you know he's a miracle baby? Praise the Lord. In the tri second trimester, he was born. Now, the third trimester is this. During the third trimester, the fetus continues to grow in size and weight. The lungs are still maturing, and the fetus begins to position itself downward. And by the end of the third trimester, the fetus is about 19 to 21 inches long and weighs an average six to nine pounds. That's almost steelhead size right there. <laughs> Not a big one, but a nice one. Now, I don't know about you, but, but it's amazing to me how the whole world over the last few months has been riveted on Prince William and, and Kate Middleton. I mean, they've gone gaga. And I mean, people flew in in mass all over because the date was coming. What's the child going to be? What are we going to name the child? Have you ever seen so much attention directed towards one individual? It's like, give me a break. You're important as that child over there, and thank God for yeah. Prince George, whatever his name is, on and on and on. How many, how many names is George? George, uh, George Alex, mm -hmm. Alexander, like five Flip, Louis, <laughs> Prince George in a can. Anyway... <laughs> He weighed, he weighed 8.6 pounds. That's a big baby. That's a good-sized baby. And the women go, wow. So my point is this, is development. 
You say, what does that have to do with me? Once you come into the kingdom of God, you begin a journey called the growth process whereby you are growing. The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 8, 29, that we're being conformed into the image of the Son, Jesus Christ. Christ, your growth process is that you're growing and maturing to become like Jesus. Now, you don't look like him. You probably won't weigh, like, weigh as much as he does. Your complexion won't be the same as his. More than likely, Jesus has olive skin. He had, you know, shoulder-legged hair, olive, uh, yeah, brown eyes because he is Jew. Okay, he's not going to be a white lily, uh, white guy that is painted oftentimes by artists. They don't get it right. They're going to be surprised. Okay, are you hearing me? But my point is this, your, your lifestyle is to be patterned after his because that becomes the model. That's why he developed. The Bible says in the book, it's, it says in the Bible that he grew in stature and wisdom with God and man. In the same way, you need to be growing in stature and wisdom in favor with God and also with men. There is a process of growth and development that is taking place in our lives. That's why Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, some of us have developed too much in this arena here. Okay, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to your spiritual worship, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may attest and prove a good, pleasing, and perfect loss. So growth comes by letting the word transform my life. That's why the Bible says in the book of Peter, 2 Peter 2, 3, 3, 18, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, you are growing up. You say, well, I'm, I'm 80 years of age. I must have peaked out by now. Listen, you haven't peaked out until you go home to be with Jesus. I don't care if you're 90. I don't care if you're 100. If you're still alive and breathing, guess what? You're learning things day by day because it is a pro constant process process of growth and development. Amen. So you're in development. Number three, it's because of our detail. The possibilities of potential are because of our detail, number three. Now look at the text again. Go back to Psalms 139. You might still be there, but go back there if you are. And it says this, Psalms 139, verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Go to Ecclesiastes 11, please. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, not too much far, farther away from there. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, second to last chapter in the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 5, here's what Solomon writes, and he says this, As you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed, note this, in the mother's womb. Now, when we hear this word in the depths of the earth, it's really not talking, it's, it's imagery that's being used that's really indicative of the mother's womb. There is a process that takes place in the mother's womb when this conception takes place. Solomon says, how the body is formed in the mother's womb, so you can understand the work of God, the maker of all things. I mean, God's into detail. Amen. He's into detail. See, David was aware that God knew him from the very beginning. His frame that was hidden, his skeletal structure was not hidden from God. When David was being made in the secret place and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of his mother's womb, there was this taking place. There was being made. It was being developed. It was being shaped. How many of you ever have ever done something? I talked about the ducks earlier, but you've had a project like that. You had something in your mind, a vision in your mind, what you wanted to create, what you wanted to make. And then you begin to go about doing it. Anybody do that? Now, when we were kids... We would, uh, we would we'd build goat carts. Anybody ever build a goat cart? Anybody ever build a goat cart? Am I the only one? Oh, man, we love goat carts. So what we would do is we would, we would go to the races. Don't tell me people don't influence and things don't influence you. Man, if I saw something, I was going to imitate it. I learned by seeing and viewing stuff. So my uncle raced at the racetrack. I'd go watch the races. I'd come home and I'd go, man, I'm going to build a goat cart. We're going to build a goat cart track. We're going to race. We're going to gather all the kids from the neighborhood together. And we're going to have goat cart races. We're going to even go buy cheap little trophies. And we're going to give the trophies to the best one that would win the race. This is my brainchild. I was like a mad scientist. Frankenstein was being born. Uh. So anyway, we started building go-karts. You know, you have to bore a hole in the two-by-four, and you have to, you know, put a screw in here and, 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 and washer and hold it together. You have to put wheels and axle on, your wheels on the sides, wheels here, flat piece of plywood, and a seat that holds it up. And then we had the big, I got the biggest pushers in the neighborhood so that we would be sure to win the race. On the day of the big race, we came together. Kids from other neighborhoods brought their go-karts. We literally built a go-kart track. And we, so we were out there racing, pushing go-karts. So my buddies were pushing the cart, and they must have been too much 
my little brother Tom, he's my middle brother, he was the driver because he was always good at that. So Tommy was the driver and he had like rope over here to steer it with and your feet would steer it. And man, you'd just be buzzing around the track. And so they were taking him out and we were in the race and we were in this championship race for the trophy that we had bought for this big event. They were going around and my wheel fell off. I was the mechanic and the builder and all that. And my wheel fell off and we lost the race. Can you believe it? It was our origin. It was our mad scientist. It was my own dream. And we ended up losing. Our car loses because we blew a tire. Everybody say detail. detail. Now, I'm a big person guy. My temperament, characteristic type is I see the big picture. I see what can be. I rally the troops. And then my wife, she's the detail person. Well, have you thought of this? Have you thought of this? Have you thought of this? Well, no, no. It just, it'll work out. <laughs> no, stuff just doesn't work out. People have to take care of this stuff. That's right. It's kind of like going camping and forgetting the food. You know, there is a part. Well, let's go camping. Yeah, let's throw the tent in. Let's do this. Ah. Anybody got the food? What's going to be the... Helen's like this. My wife is, is so clinical in this respect. Okay, what are we having on Monday for lunch? Let's just take a... Let's, say, let's do it. Let's do a Friday. What are we having Friday afternoon for lunch? What are we having Friday evening for supper? What are we having Saturday morning for breakfast? What are we having for lunch? Anybody like that? That's not me, man. I just, just take care of it, will you? So then, however, I get recruited. So the next thing you know, we're at Winco, and guess who's pushing the cart? I'm pushing the cart. Let's get that. Honey, get that. Honey, get that, get that. Well, we're going to need this. Let's go down this aisle. We need that. And it's in the cart, in the cart, in the cart. And listen, that's not enough. But when Helen puts it in the cart, it goes in there a specific way. It's just not any old way to start throwing in. Baby, it's got to go here, 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 here. And you build this whole thing as you build an empire. It's very specific because it's detailed. Can I tell you, God is like that. God is into the details. He's down to the very increment about your life. He loves the detail about you and your life. You are unique. There is nobody on planet Earth like you. Don't try to be like somebody else. That doesn't mean we don't learn and model our lives after other people. But if you're wired loud, you're going to be loud. If you're wired quiet, you're going to be quiet. If you're like fiery, you're going to be fiery. It doesn't matter. In some level, you are wired a certain way. Be who God created you to be, and you'll be a hit every time. Come on, somebody. Am I talking to anybody in the house today? As you begin to fulfill the possibility of potential in your life, as you're going in this process of detail about your life, it's going to be awesome. It's woven. It cannot mean, it cannot mean below the surface of the earth because no one is formed there. In this context, as I said, it can only mean inside of the mother's womb. Go with me quickly to Proverbs chapter 22. We're not too far away from there, so just back up a couple of pages. Proverbs 22, verses 1 and 2. Are you there? Here it says this. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Now note this. Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. God is into the detail. Now recently, in fact, like yesterday, we got a picture. And on this picture is an invitation to my daughter-in-law's, what do you call that? Baby shower. For our grandson, their son, that is to be born. His name is is James, no, it's Caleb James Manuel Torres. Holly called me, the, or texted me, the, she says, Dad, can, can, I, can I use your middle name? How do you spell your middle name? I think, what's up with that? How do I spell the name? So I told her how, I, I'm even having a dispute myself how do I spell my middle name. I don't know. So, <laughs> haven't I, Helen? Battle within myself on my passport and my driver's license and birth certificate. But anyway, so I says, here's what it is. She goes, so, so he, she writes, well, I'm thinking about including you and maybe naming our baby. I says, are you, man, I'm just glad to be in, in anywhere and named in after anything or somebody consider that. That's pretty awesome to me. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So my point is not that. My point is this, is that the picture of the baby in the womb, you can see the head and everything in the womb. And it's the same way. In the womb, God saw you. And he began to put within you the cells in the DNA of the possibility that was yet to come. I said it before. I'm going to say it again. They're sitting here today. I believe five-fold ministry leaders that are in this house today. You've been called of God to be a five-fold ministry leader. I believe there are others that are sitting here. You are business owners. It's in you. It's in your DNA today. There are other people that you're creative. You have a creative bent like the art thing or the writing thing. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that's germinating that's, that's on the inside of your 
DNA and it wants to be released. You got to begin to start thinking that way and believing that way because you're going to move towards your most dominant thought. I kept talking about, well, I need to write a book. I need to write a book. I've been talking about that for years and years and years. Finally, Robert Slaird challenged me. He says, you need to write books. You need to leave a legacy when you go and are beyond you. So I, I took it to heart. I came back and I began to move on that. And so yesterday I got the my first book that's transcribed. I got it. I'm making corrections to it now. Once it's finalized, it'll go. We'll get a cover on it, da da da, da and it's going to be available for, on Amazon for sale. And then right on the heels of that will be my next one immediately after that. Why? Because you're going to move towards that. Me going to the nations happened when I was a little kid, Danny, a long time ago. That was seed on the inside of me that began to be visualized and realized and spoken about because you're going to begin to talk about that which God's put on the inside of you until it begins to be manifest. I said, honey, we're going to the nations together. And she's been to how many nations with me now together as we've accomplished the purpose of God. And we aren't slowing down. And if you're around here, you're going to catch that spirit on your life that you are sent ones, apostolic people that are called to those around you first and foremost, to your family, to your neighborhood, to your places of influence that you're called there and you're gifted to go there and do the exploits in Jesus' name because God has detail on your life exactly the way he wants it to be. I mean, I have, I have dark hair. I have brown eyes. I'm five foot, well, used to be seven. Not sure what I am now. I wear a seven. I used to wear a seven. I think it's gotten a little bit bigger because my feet went this way for whatever reason. But I, I wear a, a, an eight. I think I wear an eight by eight. It's eight this way and eight this way. Helen calls me Fred Flintstone feet because they're like a block. You know, they're, they're like this, this wide and this wide. It's who I am. It's who I am. We all have those defini- dis- definitive things that are, I believe, distinctive details that are on us. Number four, as you're taking notes, it's because of our destiny. The possibilities of potential are realized because of our destiny. Look at, go back to Psalms 139. Psalms 139. Look at verse 16. Your eyes saw my un- unformed body. Your eyes saw my unformed body. He's talking to the Lord now. All the days, note this, ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me. How many of you know you have days ordained? They were written in your book. God has a book before one of them came in to be. So David understood the omnipotence of God, guided by the very formation of life in the womb, that being yet unperfect or unformed embryonic mass, yet in continuance, for in the course of time it was being fashioned daily in fetal form. Let me give an example. Go to the book of Jeremiah. Have you know, I'm telling you, everybody sitting here today has a call, a gift, a temperament, a wiring to do great things. In whatever arena you... Listen, if you are a garbage collector, we call them sanitation engineers now, be the very best one that there is. If you're a burger flipper at McDonald's, be the best burger flipper that there is at McDonald's. Don't put that cheese on there halfway on and halfway off. Put that sucker in the middle. Squirt the right amount of mustard and ketchup in the pickle placement. Come on, somebody. Do it well as unto the Lord. The Bible says everything that you do in thought, word, or deed, do it all as unto the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're faithful in the little, you'll be faithful in the much. If you're not faithful in the little, you won't be faithful in the much. And God can't give more to you because you haven't been faithful with what you have. Jeremiah, here we are. Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah 1. Verses 4 and 5. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you, he's talking to the prophet Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. How can that be? Because God knows all, sees all, and is everywhere at once. He's omnipotent, he's omnipresent, and he is also what? Omniscient. Those are the three characteristics of God. It's the nature of God. He says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. So before he was even born, I set you apart. Why? To be a prophet to the nations, plural, the ethnic regions that I will send you to. See, Jeremiah understood from the call what he was called to do. That's why I believe it's imperative that you say, God, what is it that you've put me on planet earth to do? As you begin to assess that call, as you begin to assess that, that, that correspondence with your gifts, talents, abilities, and you begin to run towards that thing, you begin to move towards it, and it unfolds 
builds layer after layer after layer after layer till you get to the end of your life. When you get ready to go, you're like the Apostle Paul who says to Timothy, his son in the faith, he says, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. I already know my time is at hand. But he says, I have run the race. I finished the course. And I know there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And for all who will do the will of the Lord, can we say that at the end of our life? Because we've accomplished God's purpose. Because the possibilities of potential have been released in our life. Because we said yes to Jesus. That's what we're saying to this house today. That's what we're saying to those who are listening by any means today. That there is the possibility of great potential. There's destiny being unfolded in your life. Go to the book of 2 Kings chapter 19, please. Did you like that? Wasn't that nice? (laughs) 2 Kings chapter 19. Yeah, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, chapter 19, 25 through 31. Hezekiah is the king. He writes and he says, he prophesies, Sennacherib's fall, and he prophesies and says, Have you not heard it? Long ago I ordained it. This is the Lord speaking through him now. Have you not heard it? Long ago, there's the word, I ordained it. In days of old, I planned it. Let me tell you something. God's a God of planning. There's nothing wrong with planning as long as it's it's sanctified planning. He says, now I have brought it to pass that you have turned fortified cities into piles of stones. The people drained of power, dismayed and put to shame. They're like plants in the field, like tender green shoots, like grass sprouting up on the roof, scorched before it grows up. But I know where you are and when you come and go and how you rage against me because you rage against me because your insolence has reached my ears. I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth and I'll make you return by the way you come. You came, excuse me. This will be a sign for you, Hezekiah. This year you will eat what grows by itself and the second year what springs from that. But in the third year, sow and reap, plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Once more, a remnant of the kingdom of Judah will take root below and bear fruit above. Come on, somebody. We are called to be fruitful. We're called to send down deep roots. We're called to bear good fruit. That's fruit's gonna last. Anybody in the house that would say, Amen to that. For out of Jerusalem will come a remnant, and out of Mount Zion, a band of survivors. How's it going to happen? How's this remnant going to come forth? How's this band of survivors going to forth? I'm going to tell you how. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish it. It's going to happen because of the zeal and the anointing of God that brings it into position and brings it forth. I'm telling you, God is raising up an army. It's called the body of Christ. We're not weary. We're not weak. We're not barely making it. We're not holding on until Jesus comes. Oh, God, come take me out of here. I don't know if I can take it anymore. I don't know if I can make it anymore. Come Come on, somebody. That is not the mindset of the body of Christ. We are a militant army sent on assignment to do the king's bidding. Come on, somebody. To raise the dead, cast out demons, heal the sick, cleanse the leper. Freely we receive. Freely we give. It's our mandate. It's what we're called to do. Every one of you have been called to say to your neighbor, that's you, that's you, that's you. Now listen, he's going to do it with your temperament. Come on, yeah. He's going to do it with your temperament. This guy and I resonate because we're a lot alike. But somebody, you're, you're, you're more of a quieter version. That's okay. It's all right. Be quiet, but just be, a, just be passionate about what God's called you to do. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The possibilities of potential in the inside of you because God is unfolding your destiny. It's been ordained. Participate. Choose to plan to be a part of that. He says, they were written in your books. All the days of David's life are recorded by the divine architect before David was even born. In the mind of God, referred to as the book of God, the blueprint for life is clearly mapped out so that from the very moment of conception, God begins to fashion the members of the body even before they are recognizable. Paul had to accomplish his purpose and potential as well. That's why his life could not go before the appointed time. Go to Acts 27. I'm almost done. In fact, I'm doing really good on time today. Acts 27. But you can never know what could happen between now and the end. I make no promises. <laughs> Acts 27, 21. He is being taken to Rome to face Caesar. He appealed to Caesar, and he's gone through process after process. Now he's on a boat. They're headed there. He's told them, he says, man, this thing's going to be a disaster. We're going at the wrong time of year. We could like, you know, be swamped and we don't want that. So here we go. Pick it up. Verse number, what did I say, 21? It says, after they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice 
to not to sail from Crete, then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. The boat's fallen apart. They've thrown stuff overboard. They've not, they've been, they haven't eaten anything because it's wind, and they don't even know which way they're going. Storm. goes on to say, But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, listen to this now. Last night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. Know what he says, verse 24, and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. Because of Paul, others' lives are going to be spared. I want to be that kind of a person, that when people are around me, their lives are going to be spared. And not only that, I believe physically, but I believe spiritually because of the import of our our responsibility in our life to other people, that their life is going to be spared. It is in jeopardy without hope until I come on the scene or you come on the scene. And the possibility of potential is on the inside of you to speak to those that is in your work environment, that is in your family environment, that is in whatever environment that you're walking in, that God creates divine appointments put together sovereignly by His mandate to touch the lives of those people, that they would not perish but come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and their influence for the good because of you. You. He says, I'm absolutely here on purpose. And we're not going. That's why when I get on a plane, I don't wonder, oh, are we going to wreck? And it doesn't go through my mind, oh, are we going to crash? I'm not white knuckling on, uh, I'm not sure if we're going to. I say, this plane ain't going down because I'm on it and I got somewhere to go. I got something to do. So this plane is not going down. He said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Whoa. They're going to crash, but they weren't going to burn. They'd make it. They'd be soggy. They'd be wet. But they were going to make it. You may be sitting here today and you say, whoa, man, I'm pretty wet. I'm pretty soggy. Listen, it's about ready to turn around. Amen. Listen to me. When they got on that island, when they got on that island, they went and started gathering wood to build a fire. And they built that fire to warn themselves. And, and here again, it's like the, the enemy, you, you dirty rat. I mean, so, so they're gathering sticks, and Paul's out gathering sticks. He's not, he's not a sluggard. He's not a slackard. He's out there with the rest of them gathering sticks, and he's bringing the sticks to the fire. And out of it, a viper comes, and viper means poisonous. It latches onto him, and they're all looking, see, he's going to get justice now. God allowed him. God allowed him to get bit by that snake. He's going to die. He did something evil, and now he's going to die. He just shook that thing off into the fire. I like that. He shook the thing off. I like that rotten snake anyway. So he shook it off. <laughs> Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give you power and authority to tread upon snakes and scorpions and all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you or hurt Amen. you. That's right. When the demonic assaults come, and they will come, you can stand your ground and rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Yes. Say, well, Lord, you know, I really was, I wasn't planning on this happening. I know there's a lot of stuff we don't plan on happening. We live in a fallen world, and there's an enemy who doesn't like us. But you know what? We have overcome because the greater one lives on the inside of us. Shake those things off and let them go on the fire. The Bible says when they realized that he didn't fall over and die, all of a sudden they said, whoo, hey, man, there's some anointing on this guy. He went over and he prayed for Publius, who was, the, who was the ruler of the island. This guy was laying with dysentery at home, sick. He prayed for him. God healed him, touched him. And listen, the whole island heard and began to be born again, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, that which the enemy meant for evil. God turned it around for good. Come on, somebody. That which the enemy meant for evil in your life, God can turn it around for good. Why? Because you have the possibility, a potential in your life that's being released to be made manifest to touch the lives of many people around you. Why? Because you're living life on purpose. You have divine destiny in store for you. And destiny has to be released. And it's written in the book. The architect says, it's written in my book. All the days planned for you. Write down to Revelation 20, verse 12. Revelation 21, 27. I don't have time to go there. Revelation 13, 8. Revelation 17, 8. Get the tape. Get the series. Get something. And you'll get those scriptures down. My point is this, is there is a book, and God's got good things in store for you. Because you have destiny coming out of your life. See, God knows who and what we are. He's made us. He's planned our potential and ordained our days. This act was not some kind of a blind fatalism that paralyzes. Oh, I'm just locked into this. It was the wise plan of a loving Father who knows what is best for us. We need to accept that we are His gift, note this, to ourselves, and then we must wisely use our gifts for Him. 
We're unique, and God has made us that way. Ephesians 2.10 talks about the fact that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus, prepared to do the works which God prepared in advance for us to do. You are not an afterthought. You say, well, you know, John, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here today, and I'm sitting here, and, and I'm, I'm an illegitimate child. No, you're not. You have a heavenly father. His name is God Almighty. Come on, somebody. There's no mistake. There's no accident. If you're here, you're here. And God wants to use you to fulfill great possibilities. Why? Because you are a person of significance.